that so many people, men, women, and children, have suffered so much for so long. I spoke yesterday to a variety, a cross-section of the population of uh, Kutublong camp, 1.1 million people and some women, uh, old and young, some with Mendy on their hands from celebrating the Eid of Sacrifice, Eid al -Atiyah. And stories are told of uh, witnessing their homes burnt, fleeing for their life, gunfire, missiles from the air, and even when they were on the river, crossing into the refuge that is this wonderful nation of Bangladesh, uh, the bullets kept on flying. Women that were subjected to sexual violence. And children I saw playing, covered in mud, head to toe in mud, naked or half naked, playing football. So many children, muddy from the rains that had rendered all the ground muddy. And youth that are uh, very bright, intelligent, working, somehow finding ways to learn English in that camp, finding ways to better themselves and have hope. Various wonderful initiatives I've seen with the Bangladeshi community, uh, young people learning about the media and other initiatives. And, and I came here not for tourism. I didn't come here to have the wonderful uh, Bangladesh cuisine, which I love, to enjoy the wonderful Bangladeshi hospitality, but for something extremely serious that you know better than me because it is the greatness of Bangladesh. It is the greatness of the Bangladeshi people who know what it feels like when there are campaigns of rape, when there are war crimes, when there are allegations of crimes against humanity from your own history in 1971. You know what it's like and I thought it gives you historic credit that in that moment you did not close your borders. The Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina even told me on my first trip and a few days ago that she was confronted with a decision to close the border or to give refuge and she said she knew exactly how it felt like. Millions of Bangladeshis knew what it felt like. At that moment of crisis when Bangladeshi civilians were under threat, India opened her borders to Bangladeshis and she said we had to do the same. We had to show that equal compassion to brothers and sisters that were next door, not of the same nationality, but of the same species of the human race. It comes at difficulties, but you have allowed uh, people to have a chance to live and spend um, time in this country. But my the events that led them here were in about 2017, 16, and my predecessor opened an investigation in 2019. So the clock is ticking. I've been prosecuted for two years and I've been here twice. And I gave a commitment to the people, the Rohingya people, that inshallah ta'ala I will come next year also. And we will come and I will come until such time as we really move forward on finding out what is the truth, what crimes were committed, and who was responsible. Already in the last year, this is not all talk, my team has been here for very extensive periods. In fact, I spoke uh, uh, to a colleague uh, of mine at breakfast. He's not here, one of the investigators. And he said he'd been here uh, eight of the last 10 weeks he has spent in Bangladesh. And over the last year, we've had 11 long-term missions with uh, team members uh, here for eight weeks or uh, long periods of time. But we need to accelerate. We have had 50, at least 50 engagements with civil society organizations over the last year. Uh, Shantan D Daniels, who's on my right, she's the International Cooperation Officer. She has led many of these. She's known very well in the camps and internationally with the Rohingya diaspora. Um, I myself have spoken to Rohingya in The Hague. Just last month, we had a uh, coalition meeting of the International Criminal Court, and we had Rohingyas uh, participating in that. I spoke to them. We've brought them over to The Hague to focus on crimes against and affecting children. We've brought them to The Hague in relation to gender persecution. But what they really need is 
not words, but who is responsible. And this is why with the very limited resources we have, I have done my best to increase the resources on the uh, Myanmar case, on the Myanmar Bangladesh case. And the evidence is to my left, Mr. S. Safal, who is a very senior lawyer from the Gambia. He was the lead counsel to the inquiry of the Gambian TRRC, the Truth and Reconciliation and uh, Commission of the Gambia. He's been a very senior prosecutor in the ICC uh, before. But we have to do it because there is a gap at the moment between the promise of international justice and the, the delivery of international justice. If we're going to be true to our word that every human life matters equally, we need to do better. I really would wish to thank and applaud and congratulate every single Bangladeshi because your heart, your generosity in the hour of need of the Rohingya has saved lives and has give, given refuge. And in fact, that is the only possible reason, that is the only legal reason why I'm here. It is only by dint of Bangladesh holding up the flag of justice as its own that we have jurisdiction to investigate the crimes uh, against the Rohingya in relation to allegations where one element of the offence is committed in the territory of Bangladesh. And I hope next time I come here, I can't promise it, but inshallah I will come next year. But what I can't promise is that uh, we will have results, but my aim is that there will be more to speak to by the next time I come to Bangladesh. The team have been working hard. We're trying to accelerate it and we will move forward. The conditions that... Um, of the Rohingya must be of interest and of concern, not just to me as the prosecutor of the ICC. It should be of something of concern to the whole world, not just Bangladesh. I, I gave uh, an interview just a few hours ago on CNN, and uh, I will repeat one important statistic, and it was told to me by many different um, UN agencies, and it's something I saw with really, it was very sad to see that up to March, Rohingya men, women and children were given three meals a day. They were given enough money to eat three times a day. And since March, they have, they're eating twice a day or not even twice. They're given about nine taka a day. That must cover them for breakfast, lunch and dinner. And nine taka, what can you do? What could you do with nine taka? I was told one egg, one under, one egg is 12 taka. So we should think when the world is giving resources, what do you do to a child who is used to lunch, has been living in that camp and is used to lunch? And they say, Amma, Abu, where is lunch? How can our heart should melt? Now, this is an area where the world should give support, whether it's to the World Food Programme or the United Nations or to Bangladesh directly. Why is it relevant to me? Malays, in which we have to show that every human life matters, that we give resources fairly and adequately wherever possible, that you realize when you have 1.1 million people in a camp, the government of Bangladesh also needs support. And also, if people are not eating, if people are hungry and there is not hope, it will also lead to tensions and difficulties. So I hope that the international community, I spoke about this with the Prime Minister, and uh, she also has a plan. I hope very much that the international community can give more resources, not just to the International Criminal Court, not only to my office, but first and foremost to the hungry children that are there only less than an hour's flight away from here in Kutablan camp because we've gone after lunch and uh, many will be hungry. And this can be avoided with relatively small amounts of money given the world's GDP. It can't just be put uh, on uh, Bangladesh. So these are really the, the points I wanted to, to raise. And you know the soil here is so fertile, it grows quickly. 
So you have justice is your own justice. And the justice of the ICC is Bangladeshi justice. It's a partnership based upon shared values, human values. And based upon this, I'm extremely pleased to be here. I'm extremely pleased to have the opportunity to meet the Rohingya. I'm very grateful for the hospitality once again of the Bangladesh government, the support of Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, the foreign ministry, but also of you, of regular Bangladeshis that are around Cox's Bazaar, that are here in Dhaka, that realize there but for the grace of God goes I. There but for the grace of God goes I. There but for the grace of God goes I. We could all be refugees if things become miserable, as unfortunately things became so miserable for the Rohingya people of Myanmar. Yes, cases are complex, but I think we have to do better. Uh, I think while we are analyzing and collecting and thinking and people are in terrible conditions and other incidents are taking place in Myanmar. So I fully agree we have to accelerate the action. We need to be disciplined with ourselves and to set timelines. Now, um, of course, the investigation opened by my predecessor in 2019. We've had a period of COVID. But I think, inshallah, by focus, we have to accelerate. Every situation is different. One question I received is Ukraine was in, in within one year. We managed to bring uh, evidence forward and the judges could issue a warrant. I have access to Ukraine. I don't have access to Myanmar. So this is where partnerships are key. You know, the ability to work with Bangladesh is very important, but we also have to find other streams of information and check them out to make sure we're not instrumentalized because of political purposes or, uh, you know, regime dispute issues. We have to get to the truth about who is responsible for the many crimes that obviously have been committed. When somebody is raped, when families are killed in cold blood, when houses are burned, these are obviously crimes. It's very clear, the crime base. The issue is who is responsible for that when people don't know which force. Are they civilians? Are they military? Which one? Which force? You need to find the linkage evidence. So I think we are united. Justice delayed can be justice denied. Some investigations take a long time. It's a function also of resources. But this is one of the very important cases, the cases against Rohingya. Uh, every case is important. Mm -hmm. Every life matters. But I hope by the focus that we brought, by the uh, greater presence on the ground and the more frequent trips here, by the now um, even more senior leadership of Mr. Esafal, who's under the direction of uh, Deputy Prosecutor Nazat Shamim Khan, who's in the Hague, she's looking after that pillar. Uh, I hope we will uh, work um, and be able to show results when the evidence is collected that allows us to move, but I won't move without evidence. But we need every support, we need every partnership with civil society, with Bangladesh, with every other state to th get the evidence we need. In terms of the camps, uh, yes, when I was there yesterday, they sadly, one individual was killed. Um, we've contacted the United Nations. This had nothing to do with uh, the ICC or anything else. It was an individual, I think, involved in mediation, but this is an inquiry that has to take its course. Um, when people don't have hope, when people do not see movement, when people don't have enough food. Um, it's not conducive, is it, to serenity? So this is human nature. And uh, I think uh, Bangladesh is doing a very good job. And I think those Rohingya in the camp also need to, you know, they also have to play their part. And there should be no place for criminality. The important thing is peace. Uh, peace within the camp, peace outside the camp and realizing that when people are have been targeted um, for whatever reason, nobody you'd be crazy to target yourselves. So it re requires everybody being their brother's keeper and their sister's keeper in that camp, and hopefully that will help improve harmony. But it also requires an understanding of human nature and the link, the nexus between resources, hope, um, you know, and um, and uh, harmony in a camp that is very crowded and people are in difficult conditions. And um, I think that has to be understood. We're not a development agency. Our mandate is not education, humanitarian assistance. It's uh, the truth. It's investigating, incriminating and exonerating evidence equally. 
uh, in cases where we have jurisdiction pursuant to our mandate, which is genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity uh, in, in, this, in this situation. I'm very familiar with the fact that 52% of the Kurban uh, camp are under the age of 18. It's a very high amount. But the idea that the uh, trial uh, or the speed of any uh, application for a warrant or any uh, movement is essential for return is, is something different. There could be a trial and the people can still be here. The, per the reason people are here is it's not safe for them to be in Myanmar. The reason people are here is they were pushed out, it seems, from Myanmar. They were not wanted by the Myanmar authorities. So if that uh, situation changes in Myanmar, they could go back, couldn't they? A trial can take place any, at any time. So ultimately, there is a cause driver of this. That's a political process. Our job is to look at the evidence to see who's responsible and if we can identify evidence, not a smell of suspicion, it's not enough. I won't meet, move with the smell of suspicion. I'm not a, a non-governmental organization. I'm, I have to prosecute and prove a case beyond reasonable doubt. And the evidence will be tested in the courtroom, not just questions like this, forensic questioning. And judges will decide, not on basis of this being the prosecutor, this being the defense, based on evidence. So we need a very solid case, and uh, we are doing our best to bring that case to find out what is happening, and then we will move uh, if we are required to do so. Thank you. I mean, obviously, we can't conduct investigations unless we have the money to travel, unless we can have investigators, and whether we have uh, lawyers and analysts, and, uh, you know, this has financial implications. So if in any situation, not Bangladesh, any situation in the world, if there are no resources, yes. Well, if there's no resources, there will not be investigations. If there's inadequate resources, yes, certainly it could affect the pace of investigations and the possibility of proper justice. And this is an historical issue. We have too many situations opened relative to our budget. And this is what we've been juggling with for a long time. And I'm trying to come up with different solutions that are very imperfect ones, but allows us to prioritize so that at least we can show that international law, international law is not an idea, it's not um, something just for academics or judges in their gowns or prosecutors in our robes in The Hague. It must be felt. If justice is not felt by people in the camps of Sudan in Darfur, or in Kutuplan camp, or in the DRC, then who will believe in the law? So we have to prove that the idea, the values we're trying to protect, everybody will agree, they shouldn't be, every decent person will agree that there should not be genocide or war crimes or crimes against humanity. But what are we doing collectively? The area of law is one part, but there's another part of equity, of fairness, of, uh, of the whole order, international order, that also needs to be discussed by those responsible for that aspect. We're trying our best with sincerity, with fidelity to the Rome Statute to try to do better for the Rohingya, and we will see what if we succeed or if we fail, but we're trying. And I think that's all we can properly do and find new, novel, innovative ways with the limited resources we have to build partnership wishes to be taken seriously will comport itself with some basic standards. We're not asking for the highest standards, it's the basic standards, which is to prohibit genocide, war crimes, or crimes against humanity. If for whatever reason they're uh, not cooperative, then we have to find other ways. And uh, that is something that has been done in different situations also. It's more difficult because you have a state that is non-cooperative, but it is not impossible, but it's difficult. and. Uh, we will try to do every, uh, explore every avenue where we can find evidence that is truthful, that is reliable, and that is relevant to the investigation that we are carrying out.